Don't forget, if you're an Ethics Club member, you can donate your flying hours to Models for Heroes. So welcome back to the channel for the next instalment of the YouTubers event held by Airfix. Now in this episode it's a little bit different in that this is really all about the questions that you from the model officers mess asked when I posted up some posts uh, over the last couple of months. Now I didn't tell you the reason for this but I asked you a couple of questions in relation to model making companies. So within these posts, I ask questions like, for example, we all love a new kit. If you had the chance to influence the next release from your favorite scale model manufacturer, what would it be? So the other question was about instructions. If we had the chance to influence them from your favorite scale model manufacturer, what would it be? What would you ask them? And of course, the third question I asked was, if you had the chance to ask one question from the head designer of your favorite scale model company, what would that question be? So I had the opportunity to ask and interview a few people at the event. Um, I didn't get everybody I wanted, unfortunately, because time and because there were other YouTube creators there and it would have been unfair for me to hog all of the time. So I also took the opportunity to go into the Sprue Talk studio um, and we sat down in the studio and, we, and I put some of the questions you asked to them. I just, I just want to clarify, you did volunteer for this. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's, the, what's the question? Okay, so um, Craig asks, um, I'd like to ask what is the motivation when choosing the subject to make a kit of? Motivation can be, can be anything really. Um, Obviously, there's there's certain commercial aspects. So you know, are there gaps in the market? Are there um, you know ranges that we want to grow? Uh, so do we want more Cold War jets in the range? Um, stuff like that. Um, previous sales. Um, so you know, when we talk about Spitfires, uh, we, we're going to keep churning out Spitfires because they sell really well. Yeah, um, so that's the motivation. But also, it can be something as sort of innocuous as seeing a, a magazine article in the development team and, and sort of saying, well, what do you think about that? And so sort of it prompts you to think about what you're going to develop. Um, as, from an R&D perspective, mm -hmm. Dale's probably got stuff to say from a commercial perspective. Yeah, so from my side, obviously I'm looking at what other projects, national projects are happening as mm -hmm. well. So if a group of people are trying to get something up flying again, um, do we want to be part of that and the hype around around that mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously I deal with a lot of uh, licensors mm -hmm. so uh, if there's a new James Bond film coming out do I want to be part of that and uh, release a kit around that so there's there's those things that are constantly happening um, so yeah but ultimately it's you know what do we believe that the market requires um, at the moment or they don't realise that that's what they need in their life <laughs> so um, so yeah that's the there's a lot of things happening. But, um. Yeah, cool. Uh, Luke Carswell asks, um, or oh, Sally, I would like to ask, how many test builds are done before the kit's released? It really, really varies. Um, so you'll get a test shot. You'll, you'll design it all and it gets sent off, in our case, to China, uh, and the metal gets cut, and they'll send what we call test shots, um, and you'll, you'll build them and come up with a list of things that are wrong. Uh, little tweaks that need to be made, sometimes not so little. And it depends how um, how well they've done on those first shots. Um, so in the case of Anson, they were almost perfect on the first time. They're never perfect, but they were almost there. So mm -hmm. Matt didn't build too many, um, but you always build at every test shot stage. So uh, I'd hazard a guess at four to five for the Anson, um, but we always want to try and do as many as we can, buy as many people as we can um, to make sure that if someone encounters an issue to see if it's just a, let's say, user error, um, or if it's a, a problem with the kit or the build instructions. So um, it really, really varies. It's hard to put an exact number on it, but you want to get as many eyes on that kit as you can. I remember how many test shot phases we went through with the answer? Was it like two or three? Two, I believe. Yeah, so um, two, which is really low. But whereas the Spitfire will be... Uh, three or four, it was yeah. in the end. Um, yeah. In terms of test shots and then builds of that was a lot more. Um, it might not just be a whole build though. You might build up a sub-assembly um, 
something that was proving problematic because in the case of say a 24th scale Spitfire, it takes a lot of man hours to build every time it comes in. So you yeah. might focus on specific areas. Yeah, and things like the clip wings. So they won't build a whole new kit just to show the clip wings. Wing We've got models upstairs, haven't we, in the office where it's just it's just a basic Spitfire, but just with those wings on, yeah. there's no there's no cockpit detail or anything like that. But so. it, it might just relate to the, the shell itself, making sure that when the cockpit tub goes into the Spitfire, it's all clicking together and not misaligning anything. Yeah. So it might just be the very first stages of, of the build that you do. Cool. Okay. Um, while we're talking about the Spitfire, because uh, there's a lot of hype about it, mm. it's coming, it's brilliant, it's beautiful, love it. Um, I have a question from Carl Smith in relation to the, this new release. Given the detail that's in that cockpit, could Airfix, do you think, release just the cockpit as a separate model? So we have been asked about this because obviously on our uh, walkabouts with that model, we, we've, we've sort of shown that sub-assembly. Um, but I don't believe it's in a frame on its own. Um, so we're not intending to just release that sub-assembly on its own. Uh, it's the same with the engine as well, isn't yeah. it? Mm. So uh, the answer is no uh, at the moment. If we find that, that those parts are on a frame on its own and there's big enough demand for it, then yeah, we can um, you know, squeeze a few more frames off of just that. But at the moment, it's, that's, we're not intending to. It's, it's a really interesting question because it's something we've actually entertained in our sort of concept ideas, talking about doing cockpit sections and it never got off the ground as far as I remember mm. um, but it's interesting that there's you know questions being asked yeah. about it so it's it's something we're conscious of um, it's something that's been asked a lot of especially with um, I mean looking at your 124th range right now I mean you've just done the the, the Hellcat mm. beautiful again really lovely um, and you're going to do the Spitfire um, there's so much internal detail with both of those kits um, and you have a choice of cover it up and know it's there mm. or leave it all open yeah. Um, and it's, in a way, I guess the reason it's being talked about is because to some degree, someone would like to have a, a spare engine mm -hmm. so that it could be a diorama to be an engine being swapped yeah. out or something like that. Or buy, buy a second Spitfire. <laughs> <laughs> so you can have, you can, you can start to build those sub assemblies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you're uh, clever enough, uh, what well, far cleverer than I am with it, you, you know, the Spitfires were. Carted around the world in crates. Mm. Yeah, you know, the wings were were sort of folded up. Well, not folded up, but separate pieces, yeah. just like the real kit. So yeah. you know, you would be able to replicate the sort of the the, the two or three crates that it ever took to move yeah. a Spitfire around the world. Absolutely, by having a separate kit. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, a very quick question from Robert was in relation to the um, QLB six pounder porty. The one thirty fifth, which mm. was part of your range, any chance that's going to be rejigged or retooled, or maybe even just repopped? Is that the one we were talking about earlier that never made it into the range? Um, no, I don't think so. This is no. the the lorry with the the, the uh, six pounder on the back. Oh, no, okay. I, I, there's no old. no immediate plans. Um, I would say um, it's not something that's come it's not, up. It's not something on my radar at I, the moment, which usually means there's no plan to do anything in the next two to three years. Yeah. So, Sorry to say. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, that's fine. Uh, like I said, it was a direct question from um, Robert, so that's cool. Um, bear with me. Uh, okay, so uh, Stephen asked, um, and you've probably been asked this a few times, the, the great question of 3D printers. Um, so how do you see the hobby developing over the next 25 years, given the advancement of 3D printers uh, and what people are able to currently produce? Um, with the, the technology there is right now? Where, where do you see it going? It's, it's really difficult to say because it is moving so fast. If you truly want to print 3D kits, you've got to have such a, a knowledge of CAD as well as just having a 3D printer. So buying a 3D printer is just, you know, it's buying a car but without putting any fuel in it. Mm -hmm. um, you, and you need to learn how to drive it as well. So... Um, we're keeping a close eye on it. I don't, I don't think it will change the business as it stands. Certainly in the next, not in the next five to ten years. I certainly mm -hmm. don't hope it will. Um, but we are and have been looking at ways that we could offer um, products or services via three D printers. So, um, but there's a lot of things to consider there. Mm -hmm. um, namely, supporting people that have three D printers when that's not our game. 
Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's uh, making a file available um, is one thing. Um, supporting people with files on various 3D printers around the world is a completely different game, and that's not what we're here to do. So, it's sort of see it as enhancing the hobby rather than changing it at this at this yeah. moment in time. Um, I know I think the IPMS have sort of a, a different category for three D printed builds at the moment, rather than being able to put it into the general category. And I, as we sort of saying, we are looking into ways that mm. we can use it, and and we sort of see it as enhancing a kit rather than replacing a kit, and yeah. um, for the foreseeable future. So for the Watergate scale Buccaneer, um, obviously we've we've crowned in a lot of armament with that mm. but um but with more plastic is more weight it's more cost yeah, yeah. Um, so we wouldn't do that on every kit because we don't believe that the majority of people would use mm. all of the plastic involved uh, included in the product so we don't want to add cost and therefore increase the retail price point of a product there when there's no need for it yeah so it might be that we release a sort of uh, rocket set or, or something like that, an armament set that people can go on 3D print if they know how to do all that stuff and they're very good at it, fine, you go off and mm. do that. Um, and a way of us um, keeping the price points as low as possible on our kits. And as Luke said, quite rightly, you know, it's, it's just adding something that, um, you know, a, a, an added benefit. I think we're all conscious as well of, of waste, aren't we, generally, you know, uh, with the environment and all that sort of thing as well. So. Um, we all come across manufacturers that have a numerous amount of parts in their kit that aren't necessarily used for that build, but they're still in the kit. Uh, so it's a bit of that as well, isn't it, really? Yeah, we still do to. that. We, we still have some of that because the way that the sprues or frames are split by variants mm. included. So, But you have to do it. Um, you know, there'll be parts you don't use in the build, Um you know, as simple as wheels up, wheels down, yeah, you, you won't use them. But there's also option parts, especially in the case of the ants, and I'll use that again, and that you won't use. But if we didn't include, you'd really limit yourselves in terms of what schemes you can put in the boxing, mm -hmm. but also what people can build. Because, you know, we're aware people buy aftermarket depots and do their own thing. Yeah, yeah. And we want to give them as, as much breadth to do that as we can. Um, and, you know, we include extra parts in the tooling and we quite often release a new variant with those parts in. In the case of the Anson and, and other products, it doesn't warrant it. The extra parts wouldn't be enough to do a whole new release from. Mm -hmm. um, so it's sort of a, you know, we, we want to help the modeler as yeah, much as we that's can. Good. That's quite extreme with getting other variants out. But, you know, um, people have asked for sort of wheel chocks and bits and pieces for Buccaneers. Mm, yeah. And, you know, yeah, okay, they are relatively small, yes. Is it going to make much difference? Oh, it's probably not if we can fit them on the frames, mm. but it, it will add cost some. So, yeah. And also design time. Yeah. So, cool. Yeah, it's a little bit like the old um, uh, pilots in the 124th kit. Do, mm. do you want to go through the cost of developing that and adding that to the kit? Does it make that much more value to the kit yeah. for the customer? And uh, some would argue yes. Some will. And, um, and but most won't, if no, I'm honest. Um, but we've made a, <laughs> made a decision for at least the 24 scale spit that we were not going to include a, a pilot figure in mm. that. Um, and if people want pilot figures, then the aftermarket is there to serve them, yeah. really. Um, I know some people won't like that. Um, but to sculpt a figure, a brand new figure, and to tool a figure is horrendous. Mm. So, um, and that would certainly bump up the price of that kit. And we're making a conscious effort to try and keep that under. The free figure. Mark. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. Okay. Um, Thomas asks uh, in relation to uh, instructions, um, and he basically he says, uh, "Why don't you put a QR code on the packaging so you can download a three D printable crew member equipment and or uh, instructions so you don't print those out and it saves that cost." It's a good I mean, idea. obviously we sort of covered the um, the three D printing side of it. But maybe, um, I, I, I'm sort of reading in between the lines here with Thomas, um, but maybe um, a, a collaboration with someone where you've got a QR code, you can go to someone to get that aftermarket. So um, QR codes are an interesting beast. Um, and it's something as a marketeer I'm constantly looking at and, and how they've evolved over many years. Mm -hmm. um, QR codes are great if the URL that you point them towards is, uh, is being managed. Mm -hmm. So... Um, 
if it isn't, then they just break, and all of a sudden we've got several thousand kits in the market all over the road, <laughs> all over the world, with QR codes on to download instructions where you might not have the internet, um, or you can't get on the on our website or for whatever reason. So I I can't see QR codes replacing instruction sheets. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've also got to think about uh, mixed ages as well. So, you know, a 14 year old, for example, may be better or worse with a QR code. Um, you know, an eight year old that um, has just bought a kit in the local um, Audi or Lidl or wherever is, you know, is the parent really going to want to scan a QR code, get a printer, print it all out? It's a, a, a bit of an ache, really. So, um, so that they are things that we have to consider. Mm -hmm. I do, however, believe that there is scope to have a uh, a down uh, an area on our website for uh, for instruction sheets, and stuff, mm -hmm. which is not currently on there. So uh, that is something that we're looking at. And perhaps once we've got that up and running, then we will start to broaden um, QR code usage. I think that'd be a great idea because um, I was just talking to your illustrator a minute ago. Um, and we're saying that you know the one the one good thing about having um, something you download is, that, for example, it's on your iPad, you can zoom right in, mm -hmm. um, and that could help people with small parts, etc. So I think putting it on the website is a cracking idea. Yeah, and once they're on the website, you can do what you want with them. They're just a yeah. PDF that you can you know put on your iPad or put on a TV if you're really blind. But you know it's, it's it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, so that's. Um, that's a request I've already put into the business to make happen, but obviously these things are huge. Yes. Uh, it's not as simple as it sounds, unfortunately. So uh, we'll just have to sort of buy our time. Very lastly, I'm just going to fire a couple of things at you. I know you've uh, suggested to me don't ask for specific things mm. because... Um, I'll never tell you. However, with that said, um, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I apologise for all the viewers. I'm not going to get to all the things, but what I will do is I will send the link to uh, these guys to have a look at, uh, and they can either join and um, comment or write it down in the notebook. But um, I wonder, with um, anniversaries coming up, the D-Day and Diet and all that sort of thing, big numbered, mm -hmm. uh, and knowing the way in which you have to plan so far in advance, do you think there's a chance in which you may bring some more um, British vehicles or vehicles that were that aren't covered within the, the landings of D-Day and Dieppe, et cetera, into the range for the 100, 100 years of anniversary of those things? Anniversary is a, a fickle thing, really. Um, it's really nice when you've got the product um, to celebrate it. But uh, m my boss, Martin, head of R&D, um, will never factor it in for for a new capex let's say it's mm -hmm. not as i say it's nice when you have the tooling there um I yeah you, you might as a commercial manager <laughs> um so there's there's two sides to it and i'm playing middleman here um, yeah. <laughs> um i know i set you up i'm sorry no it's all right <laughs> um but uh vehicles are, are quite hard as well so uh, let alone the the anniversary thing vehicles um you know we're quite late to the game if you look at 35th mm. um you know our niche is quite a bit of aircraft but um you look at doing world war ii armor uh it's it's a struggle um you know yeah. if, well, you, if you're looking at gaps in the market there's I'm, not a lot I'm thinking more british going. british landing crafts i'm mm. thinking more um the bfe sort of trucks that sort yeah. of stuff yeah. um I don't it's know. always something that so i i've got a big old list of anniversary dates and i look at that very regularly for um, our social media content for Brooke. Mm -hmm. um, and she's got access to all of that as well, but also, um, you know, five year planning and beyond, um, <coughs> not just of new tools, but, you know, what we've got uh, in our catalog, back yeah. catalog. Um, ultimately, do I think we'll sell many more because it's an anniversary or something? Uh, I, I think we'd struggle. And we're actually started to move away from putting anniversary dates on boxes because they become old very quick they become, they become yeah, yeah. very old very quickly and um and a lot of retailers then aren't interested um so we're, we're we're sort of coming away from putting 40th anniversary of the falklands on yeah, yeah. um you know we mentioned that the falklands um happened you know 40 years ago with the dates and everything but we won't say 40th anniversary yeah. we've done it in the, in the past we've been burnt with it yeah. so um 
I'd personally like to see more 35th and 72nd and 76th scale armor because I like my armor. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, the bulk of our range is built up of aircraft. Yeah. And so to our uh, enthusiasts, so we have to sort of try and, it's really difficult to try and cater for so many different markets. Absolutely. And then the ship guys jump up and they're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I'm really sorry. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, last, very last quick question, which is a quick answer. Um, obviously, you work in this hobby industry, uh, making models or planning models or planning sales of models. What do you do as a hobby? Well, our boss has recently bought a hunter, a, a real hunter. So my hobby at the moment, my evenings are restoring that, stripping it of paint and trying to get the nose wheel down at the moment. That's the Brilliant. that's the step. Me and my my dad works for the local museum, so it's a father and son effort to, to get that restored, really. Um, that and doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I always enjoy that. <laughs> that would be so. Uh, what do I do? So I've started running again, which is good. Um, I do the occasional bit of modelling. I started a 30 fifth scale tank and then um, I just ran out of time because mm -hmm. the wife was only away for a day and I, I never um, I never finished it. So I, after that, I started a 70 second scale Sherman and I sort of finished it in a day and loved it. So um, I try to do some of them every now and then um, and I'm expecting my first child at the end of August. Of so, you are, yeah. so I'm sort of thinking any hobbies are just going to go out the window anyway. So... Um, <laughs> Um, so yeah, so uh, yeah, I must admit it is it is hard to switch off from this industry. Mm. You go home and I put YouTube on the telly and I instantly search Airfix and find all that stuff and I sit there watching you guys on YouTube. Yeah, and yeah. I'm, what am I doing? <laughs> so yeah. Um, um, so yeah, that's what I try to do. Okay, um, guys, thanks so much for your time today. Um, I answered a few questions. I appreciate when you take the time. So we'll leave you there. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. But I took a moment in the main room where everyone was to interview Richard Bex. He is a graphic illustrator and he is the person that does the layout for the instructions. Seemed like a perfect, perfect opportunity to grab him and have a word. Yeah, hi Jeremy. My name's Richard Bex, graphic illustrator, full technical illustrator. Here are all the hobbies working for FX. Cool, okay. So, just to clarify, so when um, when all the parts are being put through CAD, etc., they're then passed to you, and then you design by yourself the instructions, or do you have a collaboration with that with the designer? Yeah, I work very closely with the designer. We usually start with a fantastic bit of brief. Uh -huh. uh, they've designed it, so they've got a pretty good idea of it, this process and step by steps. Okay. Um, we do change that a little bit as we go. Because we'll, most of us have a build of the model. Once we've done that, we sometimes tweak it a bit or we might move the other carriage around and things like that. But on the whole, we work closer together. Uh, a little step by step brief is the same. I produce the step by step graphics. Uh -huh. Or um, tell you a bit more about that. I'd yeah, please. Basically, bring a CAD file from the designers into a 3D program called Isofer. Okay. And then I can manipulate the model. And um, basically, what I usually do is tear it all apart and bring in the bits I'm starting with the cockpit and see it, and try it, and then stick it on that. And I build up all the steps. And um, then you know, I the graphics, the pages, for the instructions. Cool. Okay. Um, a couple of questions from um, some people on the model officers' mess. Um, is one question from Carl Smith is like, talking about um, color coding the image with the part to be fitted. Is that something in which you you could accommodate, or is that something you accommodate in your in the, the instructions you make? Yeah. Yeah, that, I'm sorry, I'm going to do this one. Is this something we're hoping to do, or we have done? No, no, it's just a general question. Yeah. All general questions. Some of them will be um, relevant as it's something you do, yeah. and something will be uh, maybe a wish list if yeah. you like. Okay. Um, yeah, when it comes to colouring parts, then. Um, I mean, at the moment, as you've seen, we only really at the moment use uh, red to highlight the part that we've assembled in the previous step, just to show you its location and something a bit fiddly and small. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes use green um, to highlight something that's going to be removed and cut off. Or in the case of the Wellington, I think it was, we had quite a few parts inside the um, fuselage mm -hmm. that weren't necessary if people didn't want to put them in there, but it was seen. Um, which is something a lot of people talk about, isn't it? I mean, personally, for me, I prefer, I like the fact I know all the details in there and I put it in there. Yeah. 
Transparent fuselage one now. Oh, it has been done. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, but other colouring, of course, um, not really on the parts now. There are a few things like fine diagrams, or engines, colours, but I've always got to think about people are unfortunate with colour blindness. Yeah. Um, and I found orange and blue seems to work quite well. Um, more research around the colour blind. Mm -hmm. um, uh, oh, okay. No, that's good. Thank you. Um, so we have um, a question from um, Eric, uh, and he says, instead of having them printed, um, have them on a small thumb drive, which we can then uh, put them on a computer screen, which we then can manipulate to a, a size that might be more helpful. Looking forward in the future, do you think that's something that might happen, or maybe a, a QR code where you download the instructions instead of a physical paper one? Is that something that's been looked into in any way? Yes, um, I thought most instructions were going on the internet. I thought somebody was responsible for uploading them. But only in recent years, it's something we've always asked for. So people that are fortunate can use a computer and open a PDF and Zoom and yeah. would make a nice video. Um, but for a lot of movies, I think a lot of people like the, um, the paper on the desk. You know. it's, like, it's like reading a book syndrome, isn't yeah, it? I'm more the book, my wife's a kingdom. You know. <laughs> I, I just think it's not about having a bit of paper in the air and you paint this over it and you, um, you keep it and you smooth it out. But yeah, certainly, I think. Uh, I will research that and see if, uh, if it's still happening. I know, I know if you go on Scalemates, uh, Scalemates, Scalemates. Um, they've quite often got the instructions on there. If you, so, for example, if you pick up a second hand kit yeah. uh, and you haven't got the instructions, you can, you can find them if you research them. Yeah. But that's not something a manufacturer per se does, it's yeah. something that someone's uploaded. Um, but yeah, it's just, just as a thought. So, okay, so this is this question is from uh, Stephen, and this, this this was actually um, a post I put up on Facebook. I did put a generic post up asking them um, what their wish list would be with instructions or any thoughts about instructions. Um, they weren't knowing at the time that I was coming to their first. I have not told them. But uh, Stephen asked, this one, um, the main one is in relation to Airfix, is the emissions of parts, uh, part tree page on the instructions. So at the moment, you don't have uh, all the, the screws laid out on a first page. Um, is that something Airfix might do? Because other manufacturers do it, and a lot of um, a lot of modelers find it quite useful because they're looking for a specific thing, uh, which might be a small part. They can look at that page and look at the overall screw and then pick up the screw and immediately find it rather than trying to search all the way around. Yeah, I've seen it on the other it's certainly a new starter set, so it works very well, but it doesn't take a lot of room up on the starter set. I can almost squeeze it on page two, I think. Mm. Uh, I think it is just, we have talked about it, and we'll talk about it again recently. And it's purely yeah. down to using another page, right? because um, I see the bit, because I've got to think about the page numbers I'm using for the 72 scales, you get that one page, 48 and a few more, or 24 and a few more. Oh, you know, I can't remember who put it on there. Recent spit part without looking over there tonight. Oh, have a look. Um, it's there, by all means. I don't think we did, but uh, no, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of the internal decal page. Ah, right, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, it's too late now. Yeah. So, um, so, that is something we've talked about again recently. We have to talk about it now. I yeah, I mean, it, I, I found with the um, the hell the hell um, the hell cat that you did in one twenty four. Uh, as I was speaking to you before we got on camera about the wiring of the engine, I thought that was fantastic the way that was laid out. Really, really easy. Um, luckily, the engine is used in other airplanes, so it's an easy thing to to pick up off the internet and use as a resource as well. So, uh, for me personally, I think Airfix. Uh, um, instructions have evolved a little bit more with a little bit more of that crossover sort of stuff within it. So maybe the, the coming back the other way, 
uh, from other manufacturers. Maybe it's something that could be looked at. I don't know. Um, okay. Well, thank you. Um, something from Chris Meddins. He says um, he, he wondered. Um, he wondered why sometimes on the. Um, Color callouts on instructions. Why then the, the actual color is not the same as what the color is being asked to be used? So, for like, for example, I don't know, uh, let's say an earth brown. Yeah. The color on the in the on the instructions isn't quite the right color, and it gets a bit confusing for some people sometimes. Do you know why that might be? Um, I think I know why because when I if I take a seat in a pot and a split dye probably. There's several colours rather than just putting new colours on the presentation. I have been adding a bit of colour here and there, especially if parts are touching. Yeah. And you know, I put something like an earth brown in, it almost covers up the line work. Yeah. And it goes to print. Well, I'm assuming that when I print it out, here it is. Mm. So I've got the transparency on it, like 70 50%. That's not a hint of that colour. So, like all instructions, it's, it's a guide, um, not a, a non-accurate representation necessarily of the colour, and that's down to printing, basically. Yeah, I'm sure if I got 100% brown or green, you wouldn't see the line underneath the colour. Yeah. Certainly on the printer here. Yeah. And, and also, when you're doing a, a print run of thousands of instructions, that ink is going to change slightly. Not very much, maybe, but a little bit over that run of a thousand instructions, isn't it? So that, that might have an issue to it. I could be wrong. I don't know anything about printing. I don't know anything about modeling when I'm doing this. <laughs> um, okay, uh, one other thing I wanted to ask you was um, in the instructions uh, this is from uh, Robert um, and he says uh, uh, where there are small parts is it possible you can zoom in a little bit more in the instructions to, to highlight that part yeah. is that something in which is again I suppose space related if you've got the space with on the instructions yeah, I do think about this uh, in my steps you know it might be about three inches square um, I think in, I'm always trying to get it just right so you can see the location of the you want something else in the in the perimeter creeping in just so you can see if you want it upside down or um, if you're poor or star mm -hmm. uh, he's right yeah sometimes in fact there is a, I do the one of before this meeting, um, and I need to zoom in. If we can't see it, I, I usually always try to see the detail next to it, really zoom in and narrow point into that area. Ah, right, okay. Yeah, that's my way around it. Okay. But yeah, on the hustle of the whole, I'm usually hopeful that most of them are okay. I mean, yeah, this chap's obviously found it here that. Uh, like I say, the, these questions are aimed at a generic uh, yeah. model company, so it's not necessarily aimed at Airfix, it's well, just things that have come up. Yeah, but if you, you know, as we said a minute ago, if you could see them online and zoom, zoom in, because if they're vector images, it'd be a PDF, it would be as clear as yeah. you know, it would be as pixelated. So the last question I'll ask you is, is really about um, uh, you, actually. It's, it's not a bad question. So obviously you work in the model making sphere. Yeah. So you make uh, illustrations um, as a day job. Yeah. What do you do as a hobby? Oh, I have got a hobby. Um, my whole background is art. Oh, so I've been um, inspired by a grandfather when I was about four with drawing. He was an artist, so my background is art. And I paint. Now my hobby is painting more by. So I, I do a lot of that in the spare time with Nice. And, uh, really enjoy that. And I've also been learning uh, the last couple of years uh, tattooing. So I'm really interested. Wow. Okay. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> How many colleagues have you got to tattoo yet? Well, just a few. I've been practicing with a few friends and myself. So that seems to be going quite well. Wow. Yeah. Alyssa, <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks very much for your time today. I really appreciate it. Uh, and you. Firstly, a big thank you to everybody that answered the three questions that were put up in the 
model officers mess facebook page there was such a variety of questions it was really quite difficult in which to pick out the ones that would be the juiciest but i hope you enjoyed the selection that i've made and obviously i only had 15 minutes although that did turn into a little bit more by grabbing richard um, in the main room with everyone else obviously that created an issue with the sound of which i'm very very sorry but it was quite important i thought to make sure that i let you see that part of the video i am a very small fish in the youtube pond so i'm learning as i go along but everything that was discussed in there in those interviews was really interesting and was well worth the time I may give them an opportunity to answer a few more of your questions at a later date if I can arrange it with the team. We'll see. Anyway, thank you so much for tuning in again. Uh, it's been a real pleasure to bring this event to you in the way we have. It's a new thing, so bear with us. And I am fully appreciative of the fact that there are other content makers out there releasing similar information. So it's a big thank you from me for watching this episode. Please make sure you've subscribed to the channel. Press the like button because that helps the analytics of the, the channel. But also, more importantly, press the bell icon and that way you won't miss out on any further content coming your way. But for now, from me, thank you very much for your time and we'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye.